welcome to the core welcome to the core one uh live online course i'm going to be doing two things tonight i'm going to be doing leases and then i'm going to be doing related parties i'm recording i'm recording everything so all of this is obviously going to be up to date and i'll load it tomorrow just a couple of administrative um administrative things if we lose internet or anything like that, obviously stay in stay in the session and just give me a few minutes to get back up onto the onto the screen. Um, if anyone cannot hear me, obviously at any point, just text me, just put something in the chat and I'll see it. Please don't use some of you may have a function where you can use um, something beside the chat. Um, Please don't use anything besides chat because I won't see it. There is another way to communicate, but I don't see it when I'm teaching. So if I don't answer you, it's because I probably don't even see your comment. So if you have any questions or anything like that, by all means, just send me a text in the chat and I'll, what we'll call it, I'll respond. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions or anything, administrative questions or anything before we begin? everybody good okay all right so you know i want to start with leases what i'm going to do is i'm going to do the lecture material first and then what we'll do is we'll get into the multiple choice questions and then that'll probably take us somewhere around the break and then after that i don't know probably have, we'll probably have to do a little leases after the break and then we'll do related parties which is much um doesn't take me as much time all right, let's start with leases. Um, oh, let me just get my magic marker. Give me one second, please. Oops, sorry. Okay, why don't we use that color? All right, I am doing, Eva, what you guys have to know for the challenge exams is everything as of December 31, 2016, even though we're now in 2017. The reason I'm starting with that is because the new lease section is not yet required. So I'm not teaching the new lease section. That may sound a little funny, but this is what, this is a section you need to know for leases. It is kind of a pity because the new section is going to be coming in uh, very shortly. But for the exam, not what you guys need to know. You can see here that um, the reason they're changing the lease section, it has not been very popular. You can read this paragraph and you can see the IASB chairman is not giving it a note of confidence when he's saying none of them work. That's pretty uh, negative. Now, we have one lease section in IFRS, and we have one lease section in ASPE. What I do, or what we do in the notes, is we base the summary on one of the two, and then we bring in the differences. Depending on the section, whichever one is, I don't know, more prominent, that's the one we use as our basis, and then we bring in the other one. So this is going to be based on IFRS, and then I'm going to bring in ASPE. All right. Any questions or anything before we begin? Is everybody good? Everyone's okay? Take a quick look at the definitions. The truth is I'm not going to waste time going through the definitions because a lot of these are going to come up. Oh, I have a question here. A lot of these are going to come up in the... Um, Okay, one sec. Oh God, I'm not even seeing questions. Someone is asking, is it possible to download the PowerPoint? Um, I have to email you the PowerPoint. So whoever's asked me that question, do me a favor and send me the, send me an email, okay? And I'll be able to send you the PowerPoint. I'm not gonna be able to do it until I get you guys working on the multiple choice question, okay? And then I'll go in and I'll send you the PowerPoint. All right, 
I'm just realizing for some reason, I didn't see that come up in the chat. I don't know why. I don't see that I have a copy of it. Okay, someone else is saying they don't see the PowerPoint on screen, but I have, but I have a copy of it. Do other people here see the PowerPoint on screen? Okay, other people are seeing it. One person says I'm not seeing it. So people, whoever's not seeing it, I'm not sure why you're not seeing it. Um, if you go into the session, you should be seeing you should be seeing the PowerPoint. It's not something I have to send you to see. Now, someone said they see the PowerPoint, but it's on the cover page. Okay. All right. Other people are saying the same thing. Me too. Okay, people, well, that's not the way this thing is supposed to be working. You guys should be seeing. I am not on the cover page. Uh, all right. So a bunch of you are telling me you're only seeing the PowerPoint on the cover page. Okay. This is part of the problem I was having before. No, that is not good. Okay. Let me try switching something. Just give me one second. Hey, what about now? What are people seeing? Is this better? I have a feeling now you guys see the definitions. I can see you flipping back and forth. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Okay, good. It's working now. Excellent. Okay. So, we're on the page, I'm on the page of definitions. You guys can follow along this, um, you know, in your binder and you should be able to see, you should be able to see everything now. Let me get rid of this. All right, it sounds like everyone can see everything. Okay, so I'll deal with the definitions afterwards. They're gonna all come up anyway, so don't worry about it. All right, everybody should see the scope page is what I have in front. In some sections, the scope is actually important. I don't think in leases the scope is a very big deal. The reason I don't think it's such a big deal is because it's just not usually an issue that comes up with leases. I am going to tell you it comes up in a lot of other in, in a lot of other um, sections that we have. The scope does play the scope does play a role. I, it doesn't really it doesn't really for leases very much. So I'm not going to be commenting on every bullet point. I'm going to be commenting on obviously stuff I can add value to. I don't think the scope is really is really a big deal. More importantly, let's get to issue number one. And again, please stop me if you have any questions as I'm going through this. So first thing, issue number one. All right. First thing you have to do is figure out what type of a lease are we dealing with. Now we have two types of leases. IFRS uses the term finance lease. Uh, let me just get my annotation here, sorry. Oops. Finance lease means you're transferring the risks and rewards of ownership as opposed to an operating lease when you're not transferring the risk and rewards of ownership. ASPE uses capital lease, same thing as a finance lease, just a different term. What are the criteria? Okay. All right, this is IFRS. IFRS says, if you meet one of the five criteria, we have a finance lease. Obviously, if ownership transfers at the end of the lease, that's a finance lease. Number two, if you can purchase a product at a, at a bargain at the end of the lease, that is a finance lease. Oh God, someone is still seeing, someone is still seeing the definition slide on what is going on. Hey guys, does everybody see issue number one, identify if operating or finance lease? 
what are you guys seeing? Why is this not working? What are you guys seeing? I don't even see your, your comments coming up for some bizarre reason. What is going on? Okay, I don't see your comments. Okay, give me one second. Let me try and move the little ball. We should not be having these technical difficulties. I don't know what's going on here. Just give me one second. I have a feeling some of you are answering me and I can't see your answers. Okay, um, I'm not sure I can fix this at the moment. Okay, just one second. Uh, you can just refer to the page in the bind. The slides are not working. Yeah. Okay, guys, the slides are not working. I think we're going to do that until I get to the questions. I'm going to refer you to the page in the. Um, I'm going to refer you to the page in the binder, or I'm going to tell you basically where I am. Okay. I am on issue number one. I'm not even sure what page that is because I have a PowerPoint handout. Probably page number three. I'm on page number three. Okay. I'm on page number three. For some reason, I can see one individual's comments, and that's it. Um, I have a feeling other people may be commenting, and I can't even see. Guys, you're going to have to hold your comments. Let me get through the lecture, and then I may what I may end up doing when you guys are working on the multiple choice is I may have everybody go out, and I'll set up a new session, and we'll all go back in, and the whole thing will work. Okay. I may want to do that when I get to the multiple choice questions, because right now, uh, do me a favor, some of you just type in yes, and let me see if I can see it. I have a feeling I won't even see it. Okay, Harini, I can see your thing. You said type in yes. Anyone else, give me a favor, type in yes. Arushi, I can see. Harini, I can see. Anybody else? Okay, that's all I can see at the moment. Is I can see two. I can see two of you guys. Okay, typing in yes. Okay, guys, let me um, can, let me continue. I'll tell you where I am in the lecture. I do have the notes. I'm on page three. Look inside your lecture. Okay, you should see finance, lease, operating lease, and they should start to see all the criteria. Okay, I can see Ram and Deep also. All right, fine. All right, so getting back to the criteria, finance, lease, any one of these things. Now, number two, why do I care that I can buy the asset at the end of the, at the, end of the period at below fair market value? Because this is all based on, this is all based on probability. The idea is that if I can buy it for a bargain, I will. And if I come to own it at the end of the period, then that's a finance lease. We've transferred the risk rewards of ownership to the lessee because the lessee is going to come to own it. They don't have to purchase it, but we make the assumption they will because it's a bargain. That's the idea. Number three. If I'm using up the major part of the life of the asset, what's missing in number three? What's missing in number three? We're going to see under ASPI. Thank you very much, Arusi. We're missing percentages. Very good. 
we're missing percentages. Major part. So, Irene, you're saying 90%. It doesn't have to be 90%. One second. It's just the major part. IFRS does not define it on purpose. And the same thing with number four. They just say the present value has to be, what's the key word? Substantially all. No percentage. Under ASPE, we know we have a percentage. Just like we have a percentage for the major part. We have no percentage for number three and number four under IFRS on purpose. But we're using up the value of the asset, so we're transferring the, the risk towards of ownership. It's a finance lease. And number five, which you're not going to see under ASPE, I think the point of number five is that if you have to make major modifications, and that's the only way you can use this asset, um, or, or that the lessee can use the asset, is major modifications. It's such a specialized, it's such a specialized asset. What are the odds that you're going to take it back and lease it elsewhere? Not very high. Therefore, we say we've transferred the risks and rewards of ownership. It's a finance lease. You meet any one of those five, you've got a finance lease under IFRS. They have a few other criteria, but I guess these are a little less important. They all mean the same type of thing, though, which is basically on probability, if things are going to happen and you're going to use up most of the life of the asset, that should be a finance lease. So, I don't know, for example, look at number eight. The lessee has the ability to continue the lease for a secondary period at a price lower than market rent. The odds are they will. That means the lease is already going into a renewal period after the original period. You're probably using up a large part of the asset. So that goes on, you know, that, that's kind of in the direction of a finance lease. That's the point. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions so far? Does everybody agree that what this means is we could have different accounting between the lessee and the lessor? Why? Because some of these criteria are subjective. What's the major part? What's substantially all? You say the major part is 80%. I say it's 75%. I treat it as an operating lease. You treat it as a finance lease. So based on this criteria, because the criteria is subjective, the lessee and the lessor can be doing different things. Okay, everyone good? All right. ASPE, slightly different. ASPE divides up the lessee and the lessor. Under ASPE, the lessee has to meet one condition of the three. So either they have to have a bargain purchase option. That is the same as the I that is the same as one of the conditions of the IFRS. But now they don't say major part. They say the lease term has to be equal or greater than 75%. They give a percentage. And similarly, number three, the minimum lease payments have to be 90% or more of the fair value. So under, under ASPE, this is pretty strict conditions, but that's only for the lessee. And then you have a capital lease. Capital is the same as finance. Under ASPE, we have a couple of differences for the lessor. The lessor has to meet three conditions. Number one, one of the three above on the previous slide. Number two, and number three, the lease has to be a normal credit risk, and the unreimbursable costs have to be incurred by the lessor, whatever can be reasonably estimated. All right, question. What handbook section does number two and number three remind you of? Anyone know? 
one handbook section does number two and number three remind you of? Okay, very good. I have one answer here. Again, people, I'm really sorry if you guys, I have to apologize because I'm not, I'm sure that I'm not seeing all the comments, okay? Because something is messed up here. But as long as you can hear it, and even if you can follow with your notes, I think we're fine. But if you guys have questions and I'm not answering your question, that really is because something is wrong and I cannot see your comment. I have a feeling I'm only seeing a couple of people's comments, okay? So again, I'm gonna try and fix this once we get to the multiple choice questions. All right, the answer I was looking for was revenue recognition. What number two and number three are saying is that the lease has to be a normal credit risk because let's pretend I lease an asset, I lease a machine to you and you're a lousy credit risk. You pay me the first month you don't pay me the second month. You don't pay me the third month. By the time I get to the fourth month, what am I going to do? I'm going to take back the machine. How can we say that's a capital lease? How can we say that I've transferred the risk awards of ownership? I'm going to take it back. Or number three, if every month I have to spend money fixing the machine, how can we say, and, and it's not reimbursable, how can we make the argument that I've transferred the risks and rewards of ownership if I'm spending so much money every month? So along comes Ashby and says, the lessor has to meet all three of the conditions. But the lessee only has to meet one of the three. So you could have a difference between the lessee and the lessor where the lessee meets one of the three and the lessor does not meet all three so, for different reasons, both IFRS and ASPE can lead to differences between the lessee and the lessor. Different treatments. Under IFRS, it's because the criteria is subjective. We only we have the same criteria for both the lessee and the lessor, but they could each choose. They could, they, they, this criteria is subjective. They can make different determinations. Under ASPE. We could also have a difference between the lessee and the lessor because we have separate conditions between the lessee and the lessor. Any questions? Okay, I, I got to not ask questions. Okay, hold your questions if you have any questions here, people, while I get through the um, while I get through the lecture. Okay. Again, you can try typing, but I'm really sorry. I don't think I'm going to end up. Um, I don't think I'm going to end up seeing it. So. In page five of your notes, in page five of your notes, I've just summarized, I've just summarized in columns, you know, what ASPE is and what IFRS is. That is really your first issue. The first thing you do when leases comes up, you try and, you know, you figure out, okay, what type of a lease are we dealing with? Capital operating, what are we dealing with here? Issue number two, page six. This is only IFRS. IFRS draws a distinction between the inception of the lease, which is the earlier of the date of the agreement or the date of commitment by the party. Now, that could be the same. doesn't have to be different, but it could be different. Versus the commencement of the lease term, that could also be different. That means from when the lessee can use the asset. Fine. What's the difference? Look at the paragraph and boom. All right. Why don't we do first, let me just watch more call it. Let's do IFRS first. Okay. Under IFRS, the inception of the lease is when it's measured and the commencement of the lease is when recognition takes place. What does that mean? Recognition means when you put it in your financial statements. Measured means when I'm doing the calculation with the present value. 
Okay. So under IFRS, let's let me give you an example. Let's pretend inception of the lease. Okay, let's pretend we sign an agreement December 20, but the lessee is only allowed to use the asset January 15. Why are we signing an agreement in December? Because I'm going on vacation. I'm the lessor, I'm going on vacation, I want to nail the agreement down into place, I'm going on vacation, let's sign in December. Under IFRS, what you would do, you would have no journal entry as of December 31, no recognition, but then January 15, you'd set it up in your books and you present value back to December because it's measured from the inception that's IFRS, okay? ASPE doesn't have this whole issue. I don't think that if this would ever come up, it would really be an ASPE issue. Because under ASPE, you do everything at the inception and that's all they have. They don't differentiate between inception and commencement, so there's no real issue under ASPE. That's the issue. Okay. Um, one little thing here, you can look at it. I don't really spend time on the bottom of page six in your notes. Um, changes and estimates and stuff like that. Obviously, you do prospectively. Fine. Issue number three, land and buildings. Now, again, I'll ask a question. I'll see if anybody responds, but I may, um, I may not see some of these. When we talk about land, why is that a little different than everything else when you're leasing land? What is special about land that may have a little bit of a difference under the lease section? Okay, excellent. I have a couple of you saying, again, I know I can't see everything. It's not depreciable. Good. It's a non-depreciable asset. Right. So what that means is you're never going to use up the life of land. Fine. The issue that both IFRS and ASPE deal with, and it's kind of interesting here because they kind of come at it at different um, perspectives, but they end up at the same perspective. What do I mean? One of the issues for land and building is do I treat the land and building separately or do I treat it like, in other words, do I have a separate lease for land and building? Or do I treat it all as one? Okay. All right. So under IFRS, I will tell you one thing. If you look at the bottom of page seven, look at the bottom of page seven. If I have land and you're leasing land from me, and the lease is for 50 years or 100 years, bottom of the page seven. It's for 100 years. Title does not transfer. What happens after 100 years? I get it back. All right. Am I transferring the significant risks and rewards of ownership? The answer is yes. Why? You don't get to keep the land. We're not using up the life of land because we know land has a, a, a infinite life. So why is that? Because under IFRS, they decided that if you have this lengthy lease, 50, 60, I don't know, 100 years, even though title is not transferring, the reality is that they want it recorded as a finance lease. ASPE does not do this. This would be a difference between ASPE and IFRS. Now, Look at the page eight, right near the bottom, okay? Under ASPE, land is a capital lease only if title passes or if there's a bargain purchase option. The example I just gave you, I have a lease of 100 years, title is not passing, and we have no bargain purchase option. And yet, it's a capital lease, the finance, okay, finance lease, sorry, under IFRS. That's a difference between ASPE and IFRS. 
Now, look at the bottom page eight. Should I split my land and building into two separate leases or should I have one lease? Both Aspen and IFRS really say the same thing, but they come at it at exactly different, different um, perspectives, what I said at the beginning. Under Aspie, their view is don't split it. Unless you meet two criteria, one of two criteria, either A, ownership is transferring at the end of the term, or there's a BPO, because we assume we're going to take the BPO, or the fair value is not minor, okay, of the land. So you shouldn't, you know, you should, you should watch them call it. If the, if the fair value is a lot, if the, if the fair value of the land is a lot in relation to the building, then I should split it. So under ASPE, don't split it unless you meet these two. Okay. Under IFRF, they say we'd like you to split it. Okay, we'd like you to split it unless you don't know how much the land is, or, or if the land is very small compared to the building, then you could treat it as one lease. So they both say the same things. The difference is the starting point for IFRS is we'd like you to split land and building. That's their perspective. ASPE says, no, you don't have to unless you meet these two criteria. So they both end up in the same spot. Okay. That's the land and building issue. Everyone should be on page nine. All right. Calculating doing the minimum lease payments. So what they can do with some multiple choice question is they can give you, um, you know, a lease that you have to present value back. And you have to know what to include and what to exclude. So we're now going to be looking at the formula for present value and back. And I'm going to look at the different uh, variables that make up the formula. So what do I include? The basic theory, it's always easier to understand the theory. The basic theory is include anything that is probably going to happen. A bargain purchase option is going to happen. So you should include it. Don't include something like, sorry, don't include something like contingent rent, right? Don't include contingent rent because I don't know what's going to happen. It's contingent. Okay. There are a little, uh, there are some differences here, which I don't really care about. You guys can read in the notes on page nine between ASP and IFRS and taxes and costs or whatever. That's not a big deal. Now, go to the lease term. People go to page 10, issue number five. Another variable when you're leasing back something is how many years do I lease back? Okay, that's a variable. All right. Well, look at the examples I have. Look at the three points. It's all based on the same theory. If something is probably going to happen. If something is probably going to happen, then we should include it. We should include the lease term. So for example, if the lessee can prescribe the lease terms at the end of the lease, do you think there's going to be a second term? Probably. It's going to be a good deal for the lessee. So you should include that second term. Same thing number two is obvious. If the lease rentals are going to be lower, include it. What's number three mean? If the lessee is economically compelled, the lessee is economically compelled to renew, what that's getting at is what if you're leasing a machine from me that is very valuable to your organization? Even if we have a renewal term at market rates, you're going to go renew. Why? Because you need it. 
you need the machine. So you're going to go and renew. By the time market rate, what, what, you know, there's no guarantee you're going to do it on market rate. True, but you probably will because it's at market rate because it's because you really need the machine. That's what it means economically compelled. You need it for your business. All right. So that's the basic rule. You just have to know how many lease terms, how many years to include. Now, if you look at the top of page 11, you should, everybody should have in their mind what goes on the income statement and what goes on the balance sheet in the four different situations. Operating, finance, lease, lessee, lessor. So if we're talking about an operating lease where you're just, you know, you're like you're renting the asset, you're the lessee, it's an operating lease. Okay, no asset or liability gets recognized. You're paying rent. But in a finance lease, where the lessor is transferring the asset, the asset is now being set up on the books of the lessee. And they have depreciation. Okay? So that, again, just be, make sure you understand what, should, what shows up on the lessees and lessors' books on the different, uh, the different situations. All right. Issue number six. What goes on the balance sheet? Okay, and the financial statement of the lessee. Their present valuing back, okay, fine. It's the lower of the fair value or the present value of the minimum lease payment. That makes sense. Why does that make sense? Because I never really have to put something on my balance sheet below fair market value. That's not fair. I can get fair market value. So why should I put it up? Well, I don't care if the present value is lower. Uh, sorry. If the, um, sorry, it's the lower, um, let, me, let me start that again. It's the lower of the fair value or the present value. Okay. The reason that makes sense is because if the present value is below the fair value, that's the real value inherent in the lease. But you can never have a situation where the present value are above the fair value and you should record the lease on that basis. Not, you can't do that. Why not? Because we can never have something on the asset side of our balance sheet that is more than the fair value. You can't do that. So that's why it has to be the lower of the two. Now, what interest rate do we use? Here again, we have a difference between IFRS and ASPE. Let's look at ASPE first. Okay, middle of page 11. ASPE says, let's use the lower of the two. Now, there's only two interest rates you guys have to clue into. Two interest rates, okay? Either you're dealing with the lessee's borrowing rate, or number two, the incremental, um, the interest rate implicit in the lease. Okay, the lessee uses the lower of the two. Why? The logic is every lessee, this is the theory, every lessee has a choice. They can either go to the bank and borrow money and buy the asset, or they can lease the asset direct. So if it's my machine and I'm going to charge you 6%, your choice is, do you want to pay me 6% or go to the bank, borrow money at 4% and buy the assets from me? What would you do? Do the 4%. Cheaper. Therefore, the lessee uses the lower of the two. The lessor, it's no business of the lessor what the lessee is getting from the bank. There's no business of the lessor. So what does the lessor use? The lessor uses the interest rate implicit in the lease. So obviously you can have a different interest rate being used by the lessee and the lessor. This is ASPE. IFRS says no. IFRS says, use, everybody should use 
everyone should, sorry, everyone should use the interest rate implicit in the lease. But that's only if it's practicable. If it's not practicable, then should use, the lessee should use the incremental borrowing rate. That's IFRS. So once again, we could have a difference between IFRS and ASPE. We could have different interest rates being used. Okay, hopefully everybody's good again. If you're not, please stop me. I'm really sorry about the questions here. In case people are having questions, I don't know because I'm not seeing all these comments. I want to wait till I get you into the multiple choice. And then I want to go and like literally restart the session. You guys will all have to go in again, but who cares? You'll be just spending some time in the multiple choice. And then um, I, it should work fine and I'll be able to see everything. I know what happened here, but it's not something I can correct without going out of the whole session. Now, I am on page, uh, where am I on page? Um, one sec, okay, depreciation. Page 12 at the top, you might want to have a quick look at the depreciation. Right, thank you, thank you, Arushi. I'm on page 12 at the top. So make sure you understand the depreciation. Not the most logical thing in the world. The question is, do you depreciate over the lease term or the life of the asset? You can see the rules here. If there's no reasonable certainty the lessee gets ownership, then you do it over the short of the two. If there is reasonable certainty the lessee gets ownership, then you do it over the useful life. Okay, fine. Just know the rule. All right. Okay. Now, go to page 13. Okay. On the balance sheet of the lessor in a finance lease, it's called, what do we show? We show the net investment in the lease. Look at the formula. It's important. The gross investment discounted at the rate implicit in the lease, fine. Okay. We have two types, okay? Look at them now on page 13, middle of the page. We have two types of finance leases. What are they under IFRS? Number one, we have what's called a manufacturer or dealer lesser. What is that? That means you have a profit component. Under ASPE, you'll see in a minute, we have a different name. Under ASPE, this is called a sales type lease. But we can also have a lease without a profit component. What is that called under IFRS? There's no name. Under IFRS, it's just kind of not a manufacturer or dealer lease. That's it. What's the name for IF? What's the name for ASPE? What's the name for ASPE? Anyone whose comments I could see? All right. The name for ASPE is a direct financing lease. Okay, I have one here, capital financing close. It's a direct financing lease. So again, under ASPE, I'll show you the journal entry in a second. Under ASPE, two types. Sales type, direct financing. Under i for s Two types, different words. Ca uh, manufacturer or dealer lease or not. What do I mean? Look at the journal entries, top of page 14. If there's a profit component, you set the lease receivable up, you credit sales, and you credit unearned finance income, and then you debit cost of goods sold and credit inventory. Do I have a profit component? Yeah. Sales and cost of goods sold presumably are not going to be equal. My sales are going to be greater probably. So you're going to have something hit in the income statement. After you set this up, down the road, 
the journal entry you'll see is going to be the same. You're going to get cash in. You're going to credit the receivable. And then there's going to be unearned income and earned income, like a normal amortization schedule. The difference is, look at the non-manufacturer uh, dealer lease. Notice the initial entry. You debit the receivable. You credit the unearned finance income. And you credit the asset. Do you see anything in the income statement? No, nothing. Okay. There's no profit component. That's the difference. After this, the rest of the journal entries will be the same down the road. Okay, so these you obviously should know. You should obviously know what the differences are between the different types of capital leases. Now, that was a pain in the So to make sure again, people, I don't do every single line here. Go to page 16. Okay, the chart self explanatory. All right, somebody tell me, whose comment I can see, why do I do a sale leaseback transaction? Why would I sell an asset and then lease it back? If I need it to begin with, what am I doing? Okay, good. The answer is, I need financing. So this is actually something when you get into case writing, that's a very good way to raise money internally. The minute you have assets on your books that could be leased out, you don't want to get rid of the asset. You still need the asset. So you go and you sell it, and then you lease it back. Okay, good. Here's the whole issue. The whole issue is, what do you do with the gain or loss on the sale lease back? I'll tell you the basic theory, and then you'll see the formula gets a little more complicated. The basic theory is, if I'm not manipulating, then I should really have a gain or a loss in income. But if I'm manipulating, you will see in a minute how, if I'm manipulating, the gain or loss should be spread out. I don't want someone manipulating leases and have some crazy gain or loss that's going to bump up their income. Let me give you an example. At the end of the year, let's pretend I get a um, let's pretend I've had a bad year. I'm getting a lousy bonus. I have an idea. I have an asset that I really depreciated quite a bit, and it's leading to lower income and sacrificing my bonus. Why don't I sell that asset? But I need it, so I'll lease it back and have a big gain. And then I recognize the big gain. I get along very well with that person. No problem in selling it. Okay, they don't want that. Too easy to manipulate. So look at these rules. Look at number one, two, three, middle of page 16. Um, actually, sorry, don't look at 16. Let me look at the chart. Chart's easier. Go to page 17. Look at the chart. I like that better. All right, starting at the top of the chart. Does everybody agree? There's three variables we have to understand. Sales price is how much you're selling it for. Okay. Fair value is what the real fair value is. Maybe you're fooling around and the fair value is not the same as the sales price. Could be, doesn't have to. And carrying value is carrying value. All right, three variables. Look, if it's a legitimate gain, if your carrying value is $80 and you're telling me the fair value and the sales price are 100 that's a legitimate gain. Good, recognize profit immediately. And if it's a legitimate loss, carry value is 120 recognize loss immediately. Easy. But look at the second chart. Let's drop the sales price to 90 Now, why am I selling something for $90 if the fair value is 100 Okay. Well, maybe you're doing this legitimately, maybe not. Look at these two boxes, loss being compensated. 
middle of the second schedule. What if you're doing something funny? What if you're selling something right now at a very high price? Or I don't know, we're talking about a loss here, sorry. What if you're doing something now where you're saying you're selling something um, at a price that's not so bad, um, but you do have a loss, but you don't care. Why don't I care? Because I'm gonna make up for it down the road. The loss is gonna be compensated by future lease payments at below market price. So they say they don't want to recognize a loss. Even though we're very conservative, usually we would, but not in this case. But if it's a legitimate loss and you really sold it for lower and you're not compensating for it, then you should recognize a loss immediately. Okay? What happens? Go to the third chart. What if the sales price is $130? Now you're selling this for way more than the fair market value, which is a hundred bucks. There's no way that they're gonna go and let you recognize that into income. Way too easy to manipulate. So they say, no, you can't do it, you have to defer it. That's the whole issue. Sale lease back, you understand why we do it. You account for the lease, the same criteria we talked about in issue one, okay? You just look at what you're gonna do with the gain or loss. That's the issue with sale lease back. All right, everyone good? Now, people, you guys know, you have something called these IFRICs. So, I don't know, some are interesting. They're kind of like little issues that are in the handbook. Some are more important than others. I don't think this one is so important. I'm now on page number 18. I don't think this is so important. It's really hard to test this one in a multiple choice question. The basic gist of this, I'll tell you very quickly, is what happens if you enter into an agreement and nobody says the word lease, but in substance it's a lease. That's the problem. So they go through different, I don't know, they go through different uh, um, criteria that must be satisfied. Some of it's logical. I think a lot of this you can read on your own. I don't get the impression this gets tested very often. The more important one that I really like to cover, which has come up, is this one on page number two, on page 20. Sorry, not page 20, where am I? I'm sorry, page 21. Sorry, page 21. All right, here's my question. Again, I'm not gonna get a lot of answers on this, but my question is, how do you account for lease incentives? It happens all the time. Come move into my building, I won't charge rent for six months. Come move into the building, I will pay your travel expenses, $1,000 move into my building. I'm only doing that because I want you to move into my building and sign a lease. Question, how do I count for the $1,000? How do you account for the $1,000? Do I take it into revenue and do expense it? What's the answer? Answer is no. We don't operate on the cash budget, uh, on the cash basis of accounting. I'm very happy you're getting $1,000. I'm very happy you're paying $1,000. But that relates to the term of the lease. Therefore, take the $1,000, divide it up over whatever your term is, and that's how you account for it, taking it into income or expensing it, depending on which side of the transaction you're on. That's what they do. Everyone okay with that? All right. This is a little example of moving expenses. Again, it's very simple. I think you guys can look at this on your own. I don't think you need me wasting time just reading off this really simple example. All right, let's take a look. Leases is not a popular topic. I just went through the issues as quickly as I could. 
And now I want you guys to do some of the multiple choice questions. Let me tell you which questions I'd like you to do. Can you do the following? Can you do number six, number seven, eight and nine and 10? That's it. Okay. Six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. I'm only giving you a few of them. Obviously, the others you should do when you're studying on your own. Well, let's do those. Let's do those questions. Okay. Any questions? Again, for those people, I can see the questions. All right. So, people, I'm going to give you. I'll tell you the time now. I guess the time now is uh, 7.45. I got to give you at least 20 minutes here. I don't know if you're going to need longer. So can you take 20 minutes? I am going to close down the session. You don't need the session now while you're working on the final, while you're working on the multiple choice. Take 20 minutes. I'm going to totally close down the session, okay? And I'm going to reopen it. And you guys should also close it down and then come back in, okay? I'll put a little note here, okay? I am closing the session. Just give me five minutes, okay? Please come back in. Okay, and I'll write down two multiple choice questions. Until what time did I say about eight oh five? Okay. <laughs> 